So I'm going to talk about the Nernst Planck Navier Stokes system, and this is a semi-linear e equation. So I'm going to talk about three uh, results about this: uh, global nonlinear stability in 2D with certain boundary conditions, uh, and then the more recent results, very recent actually, nonlinear stability in 3D with the same kind of boundary conditions and uh, global regularity for large data in 3D. Uh, with different boundary conditions or more general boundary conditions. So the system is um, semi-linear parabolic. So well posedness for a semi-linear parabolic system is in general not an issue. So solutions for short time existence um, are smooth, as smooth as uh, boundary conditions permit. However, uh, global existence for uh, semi-linear parabolic equations is an issue. Um, after all, the Navier-Stokes equation is a semi-linear parabolic system, so we uh, don't know what happens there. But there are um, good examples of blow-up, uh, starting from semi-linear heat equation and some chemotaxis models. Uh, so this is a system in which if you ignore the boundaries, you can prove that there is no blow up um, in at least in uh, some situations. So for instance, in periodic boundary conditions, uh, you could be able to prove, especially after my talk today, it would be easy to prove that there is no blow up. Uh, the boundary conditions make a huge difference. And um, so there describe that result in stability of a certain type and there are boundary conditions in which there is, uh, let's say, established instability. There, the instability is, is numerical and experimental. It's real. These are systems that are um, used a lot. They're, they're fundamental systems for ions in fluids. So the introduction of the fluid, so some studies there, I'm not going to give a lot of history, there's not a lot of math history in here, but there were people who studied the, the system in the context of semiconductors without fluids, and uh, there are results without fluids, but even without fluids, the results that I'm discussing now with the block, the, the, for instance, the third result about large data with directly boundary conditions was not known even if there is absolutely no fluid. So the problem of blow up or not is not due to the Navier-Stokes equation. And in the particular case that I'm going to describe, I'm not shedding much light on the Navier-Stokes equations. However, the, the adding a fluid is essential and in order to have stability, the fluid has to actually absorb some energy and in particular has to react to the, the particles. Cannot be a passive transport by a smooth fluid and still have stability, but rather the fluid will actually receive some of the energy. So now I'm gonna describe the equations. Uh, there will be parameters, so um, I'm gonna prune them a little bit. So we have, n species of ions. Uh, think, uh, in the simplest case, think n is two and I have salt, I have uh, uh, sodium and chlorine. And the ions have a concentration, the average number of particles per unit volume, the position x in the uh, domain omega, the domain is, has, is bounded, it's with smooth boundaries, but in general, it is not simply connected because we apply different things at different boundaries. Uh, transporting velocity is divergence free. There are constant diffusivities, di, for, so the, the conservation law here of uh, the concentration tells you that the flux is made of the velocity flux, transport. There is Fickian uh, diffusion, so this gives you a Laplacian with a good sign. And then uh, this complicated uh, constant, pretty soon I'm gonna make it to be at least part of it one, uh, is a transport by the gradient of a potential and the potential solves uh, the Poisson equation driven by a charge density. The charge density rho is the sum of the CIs with the valence is ZI. Now what you have to remember and notice, I am, uh, using here real valences, but the important thing is that they're not all positive, okay? 
So uh, the velocity, let's see what else. I have other constants here, the Boltzmann constant, the absolute temperature, elementary charge, they, they will be uh, removed soon. So the Navier-Stokes equation is driven by the electrical force. So this is what I was saying before, if I want to erase all nonlinearities, I still have to have the electrical force in order to respond. The fluid has to respond to the uh, charges in the fl uh, fluid, otherwise you cannot have stability. So unless there is no charge. So there are boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions, the voltage is applied at the boundary. So the potential, uh, there is a potential drop in voltage, let's say from a left boundary to a right boundary. Uh, uh, the fluid sticks to the boundaries, so U equals zero. And now therefore uh, the ions, uh, there are different types of boundary conditions. So there are blocking boundary conditions. So that now you think ion by ion. So you take an ion and think what happens to it. So I is fixed and you look at the ions. So it can have no flux through the boundary. Remember the flux is this object here that uh, carries the fluid. So the normal component of this whole thing vanishing tells you that there is no uh, flux through the boundary and the, cost, the total integral of, uh, so the sum of all the, the number of particles in the fluid stays the same. And then there are selective boundary conditions. And what I wrote here is a very complicated thing. So think of them as being directly boundary conditions of portions of the boundary. The portion depends on I. So each ion sees certain functionality of the boundary. So I can have a, a piece of the boundary that lets the ions pass through and fixes some, some an amount of them there. So this is the CI is prescribed on some boundary, directly boundary condition. Other pieces of the boundaries are impermeable. So the normal component of the flux is zero. So these are the selective boundary conditions. These things have applications. Uh, so they are used, uh, the simplest one is dialysis. So the, the removing salt from water to, through selective boundaries and many more complicated ones and nanoscale in which you have, uh, you're trying to um, change components uh, selectively from one piece of a container to another piece of a container. So there's lots of applications that I, of course I'm not gonna talk about. So let's get rid of some of the constants by just simply normalizing the potential. So at this point you can think of this phi as being non-dimensional. And then uh, the associated, I remove the charge and the Boltzmann's constant, the absolute temperature. And then uh, the charge density is the sum of ZI, CI. The equation for the CI is transport, here uh, material derivative, diffusivity, and I kept the diffusivities and I kept the ZIs. The reason for keeping the diffusivities is physical, uh, even you know, sodium and, and, and chlorine have different diffusivities. It's a pain, but it is a real thing. So you cannot afford, a session. one of the theorems will have all the diffusivities equal. That's a mathematical convenience, but it's not the case, really. So, and that creates a lot of patterning, as you know, from, from even from Turing. You, different diffusivities can create different patterns just because of the different diffusivities. In addition to that, I kept the ZIs, although they are plus minus ones, simply because then all the equations are written the same way with a ZI here. Otherwise, for the plus, I have to put the plus here, and for the minus, I have to put the minus here, and the, the, the whole thing would be looking more complicated, and I don't want to do that. And then there is uh, the um, Poisson equation for phi, and epsilon is essentially the, uh, the square of the Debye length. So there are uh, some normalizations here and the Debye length is a very small parameter. Uh, the small parameter uh, that, um, you know, I, when I started hearing about this, I was amazed that there was a, a, a talk by, by uh, Michael Brenner uh, called uh, hydrostatics underwater. And uh, the fact is that if you put some plexiglass underwater, it immediately acquires a charge and then it's neutralized on a very small, uh, so people don't understand why is that, but it's a fact. And it's neutralized over a very small scale, and this is the Debye length. So um, at this point, we, we have a, a connection between the Navier-Stokes, or sometimes it will be the Stokes equation. So viscosity I kept, 
new and I have the, um, the this uh, um, Boltzmann constant and absolute temperature, I just call it K here, it's a connection between the Navier-Stokes and the electrical force. As I said, the electrical force is a very important object uh, uh, and it makes a uh, huge difference in the whole system. All right, so uh, the boundary conditions now get normalized. So from now on, the boundary conditions for phi is gonna be called W, uh, U doesn't slip, and the blocking conditions uh, unfortunately, it's written here with a CI in front. Really, CI is not zero on the boundary. So you get, well, in some math uh, treatments, they put a zero there. That's not really realistic. So um, there is a normal flux here. Uh, vanishing is simply the normal derivative of this object. And this object will reappear later. It's called electrochemical potential. So the blocking boundary condition are simply homogeneous Neumann boundary conditions for the electrochemical potential. And the selective boundary conditions are CI is equal gamma I on the boundary. And just pretend for a second that all the other uh, fancy things are not there. We are gonna talk about uniformly selective boundary conditions. Do you see the bottom of my screen? So do you see here? Yeah, okay. So these are boundary conditions that relate the gamma i's and the w, so the boundary conditions for the concentration i and the potential. You cannot, you may be lucky to have many such relationships, but it could be that you have only one in which this product is constant. Well, you could have w to be a constant, let's say at the left boundary, and gamma be a constant at the left boundary, then you're gonna be automatically in this situation. But then if I take the same, ion concentration go to the right boundary, I would have to have the same thing. So W, the, the, this constant has to be the same on all the boundary where you have prescribed uh, Dirichlet. So it's a very special situation, but of course you can arrange. You can arrange to have constants on the left and no flux on the right, for instance, and then you are what we call uniformly selective. So uniformly selective are special, and it will be uh, clear in a second. So either non-blockly or uniformly selected lead to stability. And uh, the rest may lead to instability. So let's understand a little more. If you look at steady states without velocity, they are uh, so-called Boltzmann states and they solve a semi-linear elliptic equation that looks like so. It's a, a Poisson equation in the right hand side you have the sum of exponentials okay and the zi's are constant so this capital zi's and the little zi's should not be confused the little zi's are the valences capital zi's and um, i use this notation because um, of analogies with statistical mechanics but really it's not uh, common in the literature so capital ZIs are normalizing constants for CI star. So uh, it can be that they depend non-locally, like it's an integral of this object up above. So they could depend non-locally on phi star. So this is a semi-linear uh, elliptic equation with non-homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions, but it has solutions. And not only that it has solutions, they are in all the situations that we are discussing here, uh, they are also unique. Okay, so there are nice classical solutions for this and they, they exist and they are unique and they are smooth if the boundaries are smooth. So the constants in the case of blocking boundary conditions, the constants are just, as I said, normalizing constants for the uh, object above or so they, the integrals of uh, e to the minus z i phi star. And then there is a number here which de denotes the initial contransation. So this number uh, essentially tells you that if I start with concentrations i, i, zero, I should cho choose the Boltzmann states with this prefactor here. Uh, and because those are constant, constants of motion in the case of blocking, right? And in case of blocking, the CIs are constant in time, the integrals. So if for uniform selective, that was really what we did. We assumed that these products are constant. So I do have a constant normalizer in the case on the boundary in the case of uniformly selective so i do have a boltzmann state okay 
So um, in that case, uh, you have to put this constant, which is given to you uh, as the normalizing constant. All right. So with that, we have in 2D global convergence to the Boltzmann states from arbitrary initial data. So you start smooth, uh, ignore the, the fine print here, what kind of smooth. Imagine you start smooth positive CIs and uh, smooth initial data, Navier Stokes 2D, bounded domain, then you will converge in infinite time to the associated, uniquely associated um, Boltzmann state and the velocity will converge to zero globally. And uh, the result is um, based on a relative entropy decay. So, and I will explain that next. And the relative entropy decay um, is magical. There were results, so I want to emphasize the fact that, uh, of course, relative entropy uh, in math uh, has been used a lot and it's a, it's a, a wonderful object, uh, very little with fluids. And it was used in uh, similar equations without fluids before by, by Beiler and, and, and Norbo and others, uh, but when u is zero. Once u is non-zero, as I said before, you have to absorb elements uh, in the force and the electrical force. And it's quite remarkable that uh, it is absorbed. So there is, uh, I'm going to emphasize that in a second. So let's explain the proof I'm not going to give because I want to concentrate on the new results. Let me see how I am for time. And uh, I'm going to just explain how the relative entropy decay comes into play because that works in 3D as well for these boundary conditions. And I'll explain also where the boundary conditions enter. And once you have the relative entropy decay, like with every semi-linear uh, uh, parabolic equation, you have to have somebody give you uh, an entry in the system. If there is an entry in the system, there is a good uh, Lyapunov functional that controls something, then you may hope to uh, update that information to higher derivatives and so forth, but you have something global going on. And without that global thing going on, uh, you essentially you're you are facing the nonlinearity. So the structure here is not L2. Uh, it is this relative entropy structure. So let's uh, try to uh, define it. So suppose somehow you chose your Boltzmann states, CI star, phi star. Then the relative entropy, it, there is this familiar function. You take your unknowns, which are CI and phi, and, and phi the potential and the concentrations, no fluid yet. And you put together a relative entropy. Epsilon is the epsilon from the Poisson equation. Phi is the solution of Poisson. And you'd make the L2 difference uh, in, let's say, H1, for instance, for the, the potentials. And this uh, familiar um, x log x kind of object uh, relative to uh, the CI stars. And so these CIs are the Boltzmann states explained here. So this whole thing is uh, telling you how you compute the CIs. You chose the CIs. At this point, it doesn't matter how. And that's quite remarkable, actually. It doesn't matter in the computation that follows. The only thing that matters right now is this, that phi star has the same boundary condition. And at some point, it will matter that we have a constant here later. At this point, it really doesn't matter. You just pick uh, this uh, phi star and then start computing. So uh, I compute the distance in some way to uh, phi, C star and phi star. So the theorem is that if you have the correct ones and you have the boundary conditions either blocking or uniformly selective, then uh, the sum of the kinetic energy in Navier-Stokes uh, divided by this K factor that we had there connecting the Navier-Stokes to the, the uh, nurse Planck and the relative entropy dissipates with the usual dissipation in Navier Stokes and a natural dissipation that I'm going to describe uh, for the, uh, the relative entropy. So, another thing that I need to mention is that uh, these objects here are familiar for i for n equals one. But here we have a system of probabilities and we have the so-called Leibler uh, divergences um, for a system of probabilities, n of them. 
which is not common. So the energy is not negative. Uh, it vanishes only at uh, uh, the Boltzmann states. Uh, implies that if I have a time independent solution with these boundary conditions, it must be the Boltzmann state. And the result, the computation works also in 3D because I'm going to use it in 3D also. Okay, so let's explain a little this computation. As I said before, uh, this is called electrochemical potential, and the equation simply for CI looks like so. So it is the divergence of CI times the gradient of the electrical, uh, electrochemical potential. And I remind you, blocking conditions imply that the normal component, uh, the normal uh, derivative of this is zero. The normal component of the gradient is zero. So if you take the relative entropy and take the variational derivative with respect to the i c, you compute and you get this object here. And then if you look what, because you have a Boltzmann state, and if you consider in the Boltzmann state what's its electrochemical potential, its electrical uh, chemical potential is a constant. And therefore the gradient of that, you see I have gradient, so on one hand, I have the expression that the variational derivative of the relative entropy is the difference between electrical, uh, electrochemical potential on my unknown and electrochemical potential of the Boltzmann state. And then the equation here has a gradient, but the gradient doesn't hit mu star. So in the red, I have before the structure, the dissipative structure. So the I species, goes with the divergence of this I species gradient of the variational derivative. And this is a beautiful dissipative structure that was discovered by many, and I don't know by whom. Uh, we wrote with Brenner and cut off a paper on uh, chemotaxis in which in that case, we, we already wrote this. Um, and Felix wrote papers on porous medium in which if n equals one, you get this structure. So this structure is a really fundamental structure that gives you the H theorem in some sense and um, appears in many places. Here, remarkably, it appears for many guys. Okay, so I have N of them. So now we know how to, uh, what is the material derivative of the CIs. And then we just compute the time evolution of the energy. So if I take the material derivative of the density here of the energy, I have, and unfortunately I didn't write it uh, nicely for you, I have to differentiate the quantity in the square brackets with respect to the CIs and with respect to the CI stars. When I differentiate with respect to the CIs, I get the first piece, which has very nice structure because I know that dt of ci is um, very nicely related. So material dt is material derivative, okay? It includes the velocity. When I apply the variational derivative with respect to the Boltzmann states, it's non-zero, it's multiplied by dt of the Boltzmann states. The Boltzmann states do not depend on time, but they depend on space. So the material derivative of the Boltzmann state is u dot grad of the Boltzmann state. And that gives you some objects. And one of the objects magically is negative force of Navier-Stokes, the one that is um, giving you the forcing on Navier-Stokes, plus another thing which magically integrates to zero. So this is a quite remarkable and uses nothing but the fact that these objects are time independent so the Boltzmann states are time independent and the potential, the Boltzmann potential has the same boundary condition as the, um, as phi. So therefore this is integrable by parts, okay? So it works for any boundary conditions for the C's. Okay, so now we put this in the equation and now we have to compute the evolution of the, Navier-Stokes, which has the same force with the opposite sign, so we can add them. So when, uh, uh, this is what I was saying about how the velocity has to feel the electrical force in order to encounter stability. If there is a velocity, otherwise you cannot balance this, and then uh, you have a drag on your, your system. 
So uh, the total energy then decays and there is a component here on the boundary coming from the nice structure or um, variational structure. So our choice of boundary conditions, blocking boundary conditions, remember this is really mu minus mu star. So either the normal derivative of mu minus mu star is zero, which means normal derivative of mu is zero, or mu minus mu star itself is zero, and then you have no boundary conditions. And that is where stability enters. So the boundary conditions are essentially so that there is no boundary contribution in this integral. And you could play with that a little bit. And in two dimensions, <coughs> if you do have boundary contributions, it's not so deadly and you can still prove global existence of smooth solutions, but not stability. And uh, so this is the game here. So now let's talk about 3D. That was uh, all I was gonna talk about 2D because in 2D, uh, the difference is really, the essential difference is what does this buy, this energy buy you uh, for the potential? And in, uh, in the 2D case, it buys you that uh, rho is in L log L, essentially. So the, the right-hand side in the potential equation is L log L. And being L log L uh, in 2D, Laplace phi equals L log L gives me phi in L infinity and then I can pass to the variables that are natural associated with this, which are exponential phi times the c's. And then you can do analysis. So that's 2D. 3D doesn't do that. L log L buys you almost nothing. Buys you two, uh, three halves for phi, not, not good enough. So for 3D, we have a result. Now this is with uh, Noah Lee, who's my student and is a collaborator. Uh, and uh, with Mihaela, of course. And uh, the result is the following, that you are in the same boundary conditions, blocking or um, uniform um, selective, so there is no contribution from the energy. And you assume that the relative entropy is small, so there are parameters that have to do with the uh, parameters of the problem and the boundary conditions, so that if you start smooth, but you start small, close to the Boltzmann state in the sense of relative entropy and in L2. And for uh, Navier-Stokes or Stokes, you, but we, this is a Navier-Stokes result, you need H1 to be small. Then there exists a global 3D solution of Navier-Stokes coupled with uh, uh, Nurse Planck and uh, they converge to the steady the state. state. So stability requires only small initial relative entropy and L2 departure from concentrations. So that's satisfactory. It doesn't require 100 derivatives to be small. And I'll explain in one line, the proof, on page, the proof. I think like with everything else, there must be some idea. There is an idea <laughs> in addition to the energy. So the energy is, uh, this, is this energy is the sum of kinetic energy of the Navier-Stokes and relative entropy. So it's not increasing, so it's small, initially stays small. And then we propagate smallness in L2 using the energy. So the energy controls the, diff the L1 norm of differences, and you'll see it below, by relative entropy inequalities. And the smallness uh, of um, the L2, propagation of L2, is using this L uh, entropy inequalities. And then you have forces in Navier-Stokes. And that force in Navier-Stokes needs to be maintained to be small. And that is done because the force in the Boltzmann state is a gradient. So let's uh, do this with math. You take the L2 norms of uh, the concentrations. And at the end of the day, with the boundary conditions, you get a equation with a damping term for, so for this norm. Some nonlinearity that's super linear, that's harmless for this because it can be absorbed here. And the forcing. And the forcing is made from Navier-Stokes. Uh, this is notation from way back from the blue book. So this is L2. L2 squared, Navier-Stokes, and the sum of L1 departures. Okay. Now, in order to obtain control of L1 departures, you need to use some inequality. This is a chisar kullback inequality in general that tells you that the relative entropy controls for if this is small, a little calculus shows you that uh, F minus G L1 is small. So I'm controlling 
the Z part, epsilon is small, and uh, L1 by epsilon as well. So this is controlled to be small, and then you have to control L2 in a, a small, now the Stokes is driven, but it's driven by the projection on divergence free of rho grad phi, and in the steady state, that projection is zero because rho star is a function of phi. That's really non-trivial. And therefore, I have a pressure balance. At the end of the day, this goes, the velocity goes to zero. The pressure goes to the pressure balance from here. And then, uh, 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 but now you can control uh, in, by bootstrap, you control U in L2 as well. So that's essentially the idea. So these are the two components. One is a Chisar pullback inequality that controls the energy, this kind of uh, standard energy estimates, and the fact that you're lucky that the force in Navier Stokes, that's the reason why the force in the Navier Stokes goes to zero. All right. Now, um, the other case. So let's see. I, I still have like 10 minutes, I think. So uh, the other case is with Dirichlet boundary conditions. So let's recap the equation. Now here is Navier Stokes driven by uh, the electrical forces. I cannot tell you how much I love these electrical forces. I, I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm going to tell you later, you're going to see some, some I'm, I'm going to talk about evil electrical forces someday. OK, so these are the good electrical forces. So um, you have Navier Stokes driven by the electrical forces, divergence free. Um, you have this uh, CI, remember the ZIs are not the same sign. And you have the, the Poisson equation with the charge uh, density. And boundary conditions, now we ignore everything else. We put some functions on the boundary for CIs and some function for phi. Arbitrary, smooth, positive for the gammas and nothing else, no other information. The parameters are fixed, boundary conditions are fixed, all constants are allowed to depend on boundary conditions uh, uh, and parameters, but not on initial data. The initial data are smooth and positive. By the way, positivity is preserved. You have to prove that positivity is preserved in all, all these equations, but you can. So um, there are no Boltzmann states in general because of that kind of uh, constancy that Z needs to be a constant, even if it depends on phi star, it has to be one constant per C, per, per, per species, and uh, boundary conditions might not allow you to do that. So no Boltzmann in general, and instabilities have been observed numerically and experimentally. So this is a real interesting case. You don't know what happens. You, um, we have numerics. There are people who've been doing numerics in, in Stanford. Uh, as I said, this is, there are analogies. People mention analogies with, uh, with uh, rayleigh Benard convection and turbulence and so forth. I think they're, they're um, at this point, I didn't see real turbulence. I've, saw, I've seen, however, instabilities. So what do we do? First, we have to establish what kind of solutions we are dealing with. And I am going to talk about strong solutions because you can prove, like with Navier-Stokes, your boundaries are smooth, data are smooth. Once you are strong, you can update your smoothness as much as you wish. So strong solutions are simply like in Navier-Stokes, L infinity of H1, L2 of H2. These are notations from the blue book. So V is divergence free H1. A, a, this particular case, H01. And the Cs are the same type. L infinity with values in H1, L2 with values in H2. So we're going to, and solutions in the sense of distributions, which in fact, there will be also uh, dissipative for Navier-Stokes because you, you can integrate that part. So um, the theorem is that if you have, um, so there is a, a I hate to call it a Bill Katomada, but it's not neither Bill Katomada nor uh, Serin Prodi, but it tells you what's going on. And what it tells you is that the quantity you need to control for the, in the case of Stokes, for instance, where you couple with Stokes, then the quantity you need to control is the charge density in L2 raised to the power four. So time integral of that controls everything. And you can, if you have that quantity constant, you can extend the solution beyond, there is no blow up up to the time T1. The same thing for Navier-Stokes, plus you need to add 
a condition for Navier Stokes. And I put here uh, the simple condition of uh, H1 to power four, which is uh, the vorticity condition. Uh, but you can put the uh, prodiserine just as well. These are all like, uh, equivalent at this point. So uh, a condition for Navier Stokes, which is familiar, plus the same condition before. And if you are in Navier Stokes, you start with strong solution, you stay strong. So uh, in fact, what this is, is simply an a priori estimate. If you consider these two quantities, the L4 uh, uh, in time with values in L2 for uh, the charge density and uh, the Navier-Stokes H1, so L4 uh, in time with values in H1 for Navier-Stokes, then you control the quality of being strong, which is L infinity of H1, L2 of H2, in terms of initial data and this quantity. So basically R of T is the same quantity and we are, we are, we are, um, we are in business. So if these are finite, you control uh, your uh, H1-ness uh, and then you have local existence, so you cannot blow up. Okay, so this is really standard, but it's very economical. So in order to prove global existence, you need to control this guy. So the theorem is that uh, there two cases in which we can prove global existence in 3D for large data, arbitrary Dirichlet. And one is for two species. So for simplicity, we take valences one and minus one. So I have uh, here, I, I, I have anions and cations. Uh, and then you have global existence. And for the Navier-Stokes, you have to also assume the corresponding problem for the Navier Stokes, we have global existence for two species, or if you want n species, we know how to do it with uh, all diffusivity is equal, and we don't know how to do it otherwise. And you'll see why. Okay, so something needs to give here. Okay, you don't have control of this. So the idea of the proof is the following I have the Navier Stokes or Stokes energy driver, which is here. And I want to consider a functional of uh, the concentrations and the potential to cancel the driver in Navier-Stokes. Why? Because I cannot afford this object on the right-hand side. This is cubic. One, two, three unknowns. Cubic without control beats quadratic and that's um, life, okay? So you have to control, in long time, you have to control uh, all the nonlinearities in some low norms or uh, you don't uh, win. So the way we do it is the following. We uh, write the homogeneous part, so you solve the harmonic uh, function with boundary condition W, and you uh, add it to the solution of uh, the Poisson equation with zero boundary conditions, phi zero, and we introduce the potential energy, which is, um, the integral of gradient rho, gradient phi zero squared, which is written here like this, okay? And this one, um, it solves, it doesn't decay, but it does the job. So if you take its time derivative, there will be some dissipation that's really not very important. You get on the right-hand side, the right kind of electrical force that you're going to cancel with the Navier-Stokes. This one has a plus, and if you look here, this one has a minus, okay? And then there are errors or growth terms, and what is essential and non-trivial here is that the growth terms are of the type rho times departure, rho times u, okay? So they are no, they're quadratic, the worst are quadratic, and there are u row types and c row type, and no, for instance, u c type. Okay, so this will be essential for what follows. So now, how do we do quadratic? How do we control quadratic quantities? So let's look at the difference between ci and some extension of the boundary conditions, the smooth extensions, and call them qi. So this solve an equation that looks like nernst planck but there are on the right hand side some errors and the errors are not just forces, they're uh, affine expressions, they're using them and there are phi's in them, okay? But they're, they're in some sense, they're linear, they're fine, affine plus some non-homogeneous term. 
but they are not quadratic. And then remember, this is a nonlinear equation. There is here uh, a um, quadratic term. So in n equals two, let's show the two proofs uh, and I'll be done in like uh, two minutes. Okay. So, because um, there, there must be something that gives. So in the, if you take the L2 uh, evolution, you get the nonlinear term, which is here in red. And the nonlinear term plus uh, some linear terms that might bother you, but let's see. Okay. The nonlinear term in our case is zi qi squared, that z1 is one and z2 is minus one. So it's q1 squared minus q2 squared times rho. And now you remember q's are just translations of the, the c's. So q1 minus q2 is rho times plus something. And q1 plus q2 is c1 plus q2 minus something. But c1 plus c2 is positive and is larger than c1 minus c2 in modulus. So I have a row, another row, and another row. So I have in the, then the energy obeys an inequality like this with a dissipation that's row cube. And now we're done. This is quadratic and the nonlinearity. So if I add a small, so this is maybe large, but I can multiply by a small quantity, small uh, constant, to hide it in the dissipation new grad u square. So if I multiply this by a small constant, constant delta, then this energy, which is L2 plus my favorite potential guy and delta have, has a balance like so. And the reason for that is that although P has growth, the growth is of the type QP and uh, Q rho and U rho, but I have a rho cube, and a small quantity times a cubic beats a large quantity times a quadratic. And that's what uh, ends up by being this. And this implies that you have uh, L2 bounds for the C's and L2 bounds, remember, uh, for the C's give you a row L infinity of L2, which is more than L4 of L2. For N species, um, you do similar trick with the sum. So you, you write a very nice equation. This is actually mimicking the ca case of two again for the sum, but then you have to have the same diffusivity and doesn't work otherwise. So then for these two quantities is the same kind of trick in which you have a nonlinearity and some linear pieces. And the nonlinearity again gives you a cubic dissipation. And then uh, you have exactly the same argument. You take um, a small quantity times this object to annihilate the potential growth from here from the Navier-Stock dissipation and you get this bound. So that's all. I'm going to put up my constant, my conclusions, which are just a recap. So thank you very much.